So it's a great pleasure to, to welcome you all here at the London Business School at this joint event of uh, London Business School, Wheeler Institute for Business and Development, the schools of advancement. Uh, uh, more generally, we thought as London Business School that we have to do something uh, about the ongoing cost of living crisis uh, in our country that of course has not only a local but also an international uh, viewpoint. So we're really privileged and honored to have you all here. We have approximately 1,200 people who registered to attend this event online. My friends from Greece, uh, actually some people who woke up early in the morning in San Francisco. So uh, we really encourage all of you uh, to post questions. And uh, uh, Patricia Cohen, let me introduce uh, our speakers first. And let me start with our host. Uh, Patricia Cohen is the, GIF, is the chief economics correspondent of the New York Times. And for the past year uh, or so, she has been based in London. Uh, Patricia uh, has also written a very interesting uh, book uh, that I need to, to read. It's about middle age. Um, so uh, thanks a lot, Patricia, for joining us. So uh, it's for me quite a, a privilege and honor to welcome uh, four and introduce four dear friends and colleagues of mine. Uh, let me start uh, from my right. Linda Yu uh, is an adjunct professor of economics at the London Business School. Uh, Linda has a very interesting and exciting career. Uh, she has written, let me start, 12 different books, uh, many of them about the economic transformation of China, although my preferred one is her second to last book about the, the lives and the thinking of great economists. Uh, Linda is teaching many interesting electives uh, at the London Business School. Uh, she has also been a journalist. She has worked as a lawyer uh, doing deals uh, in China, and we look forward to her uh, insights. Uh, Paolo Surico, uh, my other great uh, colleague, has done very important work uh, on the British economy, uh, on fiscal and monetary policy, on the impact of uh, stabilization policies on households, on corporate finance. Uh, so, Paolo, thanks a lot for being with us. Uh, Lucrezia Reichlin, uh, who sits at the center, we call her our queen uh, at the Department uh, of Economics. Uh, Lucrezia was my former boss uh, at the European Central Bank. Uh, she was there the chief economist for many years. And after leaving the ECB, she joined uh, the London Business School as a professor of economics. Uh, she also uh, runs, uh, uh, now casting, a very innovative uh, firm on macroeconomic now casting and forecasting. Uh, to her right, uh, Andrew Scott, uh, also a professor of economics uh, at the London Business School. Uh, Andrew has been one of the, uh, of the greatest uh, British macroeconomists, I would say, uh, but more recently has been working a lot on a topic very interesting for me. It's about the 100-year life uh, and about longevity, not only about middle life crisis, but you know, hopefully we'll make it to 100. Uh, and now he's uh, working on his, uh, on his uh, forthcoming book. So let me not uh, spare you more about uh, our panelists. Uh, thank you all for being with us. Patricia, thanks a lot for, for being with us and uh, hosting this discussion. Uh, you can start uh, posting your questions online, and Patricia has an iPad or something, and you know, she will be able to direct them to our uh, distinguished guests. Thank you all. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, it's uh, actually, I just my first year anniversary having moved to London, and I can't think of a more interesting economic time, uh, and not only economic time to have moved here. Um, we're going to have uh, each of our panelists will give a little speak for briefly, then we'll have a Q&A, hopefully have a discussion, a conversation, uh, and include your, your questions as well from the audience. But Andrew, why don't we start with you, and if you could kind of start out with just kind of place us, situate us uh, for the crisis now that's going on in the UK. Yeah, so I was told to set the scene uh, for the UK. And as, as, as I was thinking through what to say, I was thinking, I hope none of you have come to an event called the cost of living crisis uh, with a group of economists expecting to be cheered up by the event. <laughs> uh, you know, economics is the dismal science and there's a lot to be dismal about. So I, I kind of see the cost of living crisis not just about a big increase in prices that's happening, but something more general, which is a squeeze on the standard of living. And, you know, that's not just something for 2022. If you look back to at least 2007, eight, trend growth in the UK, as in most of the high-income countries, has really been disappointing. It's been weak. There hasn't been much trend growth. So we're not seeing an increase in the standard of living. And then, of course, that's going to be compounded because if you look at most forecasts, 
we're about to see quite a deep recession. It probably may even be in one already. So it's not just a long-term trend. The short-term dynamics is looking pretty awful. Uh, and I, it's rare to see such a uniformity of opinion amongst economists about a global level how many engines are going wrong. So there's the trend growth. Then there's, of course, been problems about inequality. And if the average isn't doing very well and you've got growing inequality, then, of course, those who are below average are doing particularly badly. So that's obviously going to be a real squeeze on the standard of living. Uh, and then you know, we bring ourselves to the, uh, the, the increase in prices that's happening. I suspect we'll have a lively debate about how much of that is overall inflation, an increase in all prices, but also a big part of it is a big change in relative prices. The price of energy has soared. Uh, and of course, that means we're worse off. And you know, for a, an economy to have not much growth, and also a terms of trade shock for the things that you're importing to go up a lot compared to the things you're exporting, that means your standard of living falls. And there's nothing you can do about that. All you can then say is, well, who's going to bear the cost? And what's the balance between taxes and benefits? And how much do we punt it to the future generations rather than today? But that, you know, that's the origins for me of this cost of living crisis. And they're all pretty fundamental problems. You know, it's the World Cup and we're worrying about the England midfield and we bring in Phil Foden and everything's fine. But these are pretty deep-seated problems we've got here. They're about long-term growth, structural trends around inequality, uh, and, you know, who knows how long this increase in energy prices are going to persist. But these seem very fundamental long-term problems to deal with. Thank you. Linda, maybe you could go into some of the, you know, kind of global causes of that, and then Paolo, perhaps you could talk about more kind of the particularly British issues. Um, I really hope you're right about Phil Folded, by the way, <laughs> for the Games Against Wales on Tuesday. Um, so um, I think probably I'll highlight two different um, global supply side shocks that have added to um, imported inflation, which is a big driver of the inflation in this country. I mean, the first one is supply chain uh, dislocation. So the pandemic obviously caused um, borders to be shut down. And then unwinding that has taken some time. And so, for instance, the World Bank estimates about 8% of ships in the world were all in the wrong places. But I think what happened, and I think that's quite familiar with uh, familiar to all of you here, is that as that supply chain disruption was unwinding, we also then had a second shock, which was Russia evading Ukraine um, in February of this year. Now, um, Elias um, gave a kind introduction and mentioned uh, my, my, my uh, not my next book, but my last, uh, my previous book. And I quote Mark Twain, who said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> you know, so unfortunately, um, this uh, shock from the um, Russia invasion of Ukraine is reminiscent of the 1970s because it is, um, has pushed up energy prices. But the reason I cite Mark Twain is um, a different, there are many differences between uh, what's happened this year versus um, the two shocks in the 1970s, the Yom Kippur War and the Iranian Revolution and then the war with Iraq that followed at the end of that decade. Um, you have the energy shock today. You also have a commodity shock, hard and soft commodities. So everything from fertilizer to, um, to metal. So what you have is a pretty uh, widespread um, set of supply side shocks. And some of that has been passed through um, and that's the debate, I'm sure, about how much of it has actually been uh, passed through when you look at measures like core inflation, which uh, strip out volatile items like energy and food, and you try and see how much of the inflation um, is still there, even once these price effects um, have gone. And then just finally, uh, another, uh, the supply chain dislocations that I mentioned, um, unfortunately, are still with us because not all countries in the world have the ability to live with COVID or the political decision to live with COVID. And I'm talking about China, which has a zero COVID policy. And because of that, they're still shutting down um, cities and indeed borders. And if you look at the degree of uh, dislocation from the shutdown around Shanghai, it affects not just Shanghai, but the area um, around um, the big um, southern parts of China, which are big suppliers um, in terms of uh, components um, and um, affects supply chain. So what you still have are these ongoing shocks to supply chains. And I think all of those things are contributing to um, 
you know, picking up my Andrew's point about slow growth, this feeling that maybe we are looking at a period of stagflation, so inflation plus a stagnant economy. Um, and this is why the cost of living uh, crisis feels so pertinent um, right now. Um, but remember Mark Twain, it doesn't, history doesn't repeat, so we could end up with a better outcome than uh, three years of high inflation, double digit interest rates, and a double dip recession in the early 1980s. We better quickly move on. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's actually a hopeful note, so it's good to hear that. Okay, Paolo, why don't you, if you could talk more domestically about what's happening in the UK. So what's going on globally is uh, price pressure. This is common to many advanced economy. And also the interest rate increase that uh, central bank have started to activate as a response to that. Something, however, that is specific of the British economy is the way that the mortgage market works and the way that uh, increasing inflation and interest rate transmit to household and firms. When you have a fixed rate uh, uh, mortgage market, like for example in the, U in the U US, an increase in prices could actually be good news because your mortgage is fixed in nominal terms, your income is going up, and you don't have to worry of your refinancing your, your deal. But this is not the case in the, in the UK. While by now fixed rates are much more popular than variable rate, the most popular product is still a two-year fix. This means that uh, households that will have to refinance themselves uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, very soon, they are going to face interest rates that are between 4 and 5 percent higher than they used to be just two years ago. Just to put things in perspective, the Financial Conduct Authority at the Bank of England estimated between the end of this year and the full 2013, 2023, there will be more than 2 million households coming up to refinance their mortgage. Again, to, think, to put things in perspective, in the UK there are about 7 million households with a mortgage. So a significant share of households and I know from my, my own research on the topic that following an increase in interest rate, also with a mortgage, are the ones that cut their consumption more following an interest rate increase. I'm afraid I'm not going to help a little bit uh, with uh, the bad news coming, because this is not the end of the story. Something that is not very much appreciated in advanced economy is that in fact 40%, and the UK is not exception, 40% of SME, of small and medium enterprise, actually secure their corporate loan either against residential property or personal guaranteed on the home value of their director. This implies that a shock to the mortgage market, a shock on house prices, does not simply have effect on the household side, but has also a significant effect on SME finance. Again, from my own research, I have shown that following an increase in interest rate are the young SME that contract their borrowing most through the house price channel, and when they cut their corporate borrowing, it also cut their investment. But for the good news, I'm hoping that Lucrezia could help out <laughs> in the next intervention. Uh, Lucrezia, if you could talk maybe about fiscal and monetary policy and, and where we are with that. Okay, so now the situation is pretty bad, as you heard, <laughs> so, that, uh, uh, so that means that actually monetary and fiscal policy face very difficult uh, trade-offs. Uh, so let me start with monetary. Um, there has been a tightening in the last few months. Actually, uh, some people think that tightening has not been enough, but if you think about it historically, in 12 months, so we have seen several increase in interest rate, which now interest rate was zero, is now 3%. And uh, actually, the yield curve has already shifted, so you, you can see that tightening is already working through the economy and making the situation that uh, Paolo uh, described in the mortgage market and in SMEs uh, uh, quite, uh, you know, material. Now, of course, there is a discussion on whether uh, you know, they have been behind the curve, they should have tightened uh, uh, faster, and uh, you know, as you can see, the Monetary Policy Committee has been split on this issue. Uh, my own view is that actually maybe they have been a little bit late, maybe a few months late, but facing a shock which is fundamentally 
a terms of trade shock, monetary policy does not have much power. Monetary policy acts through demand is very difficult. I mean, the trade-offs facing a supply type of shock are very harsh, so you can actually compute how much would have cost in terms of unemployment to tighten faster. Now, having said that, you know, monetary policy faces an incredible amount of uncertainty, which in the UK is much more substantial than in the US and the Eurozone. You can say that in the US, uh, inflation is mostly now driven by demand. Monetary and fiscal policy have been quite expansionary, you know, you know, coming out of COVID. In the Eurozone, uh, is mostly in terms of trade uh, shock because the Eurozone is an importer of oil, you know, unlike the US. In the UK, we have had both, okay? So we have had both you know, expansionary monetary and fiscal may be too long, and then in terms of trade shock. So now, you know, they have to catch up. Another important concern is the interaction between monetary and fiscal policy. I mean, for all of you who live in the, US, in, in the UK, you know that fiscal policy has been all over the place. And uh, in September, we had uh, a very bad episode uh, of, uh, you know, an attempt uh, to, you know, to do unfunded fiscal policy in, in a situation of great uncertainty. We could discuss about the substance of that measure, but clearly the way in which it was done and the attack on the governance and the institutional framework of the, of, of, the UK, of the UK was not very constructive. The Bank of England reacted. In my view, that was a success. Now interest rate, 10 years interest rates on UK government bonds are back to the levels of Germany in the US, however, it has damaged uh, the credibility. Now we have a new fiscal uh, package, which in my view is quite balanced, is, uh, you know, it gives a little bit of easing until 2024, 2025, when actually the crunch will come. So it's quite convenient for this government because, you know, mm -hmm. the crunch uh, is uh, postponed to the after the election. So this is the right thing to do from the economic point of view. From the political economy point of view, there is the issue of uh, is it credible that the new government that will actually implement the crunch is the horizon too long? So that adds a bit of uncertainty, which actually creates also a problem for the Bank of England because in order to get back to 2%, the Bank of England has to consider you know, the path of fiscal policy because inflation is the result of both monetary and fiscal. Um, there's a lot of points to follow up on, uh, but, but, but let me just, Lucrezia, as long as you just brought this up, you, you mentioned that you thought the Bank of England reacted slowly, but what about the argument, given the fact that you said monetary policy in this situation does not have much power, and that it's not completely demand driven, certainly not in Europe and less so here compared to the United States. What about the argument that perhaps now though, the banks are going too far, too fast? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I said perhaps it acted too slowly, but uh, you know, in my view, this is not uh, a large mistake. And actually, as I said, like if, if they, you also have to ask the question, what if they had acted uh, you know, much more timely? I mean, what would have been the cost in terms uh, of uh, uh, you know, slack in the economy. I mean, there, there are issues on labor market that may, we may want to discuss later. Now, right now, uh, in my view, uh, I think that the, the monetary policy is already tightened. I mean, at least since November, uh, monetary policy is already tightened. And in fact, uh, although some of the members on the monetary policy com committee don't think so, if you look at the forecast of the Bank of England, uh, inflation uh, will go below target uh, in 2024, mm. assuming the interest rate path, mm -hmm. which is the current, assuming 3%, mm -hmm. which is the current uh, mm -hmm. interest rate now. So in their own view, uh, what is going to happen now is a substantial slowdown of the economy, which will create downward pressure on inflation and, uh, um, and that, that mm -hmm. means that you know, inflation mm -hmm. will be actually below 2% mm -hmm. uh, in a year from uh -huh. now. Um, Lucrezia mentioned some of the policy mistakes. Andrew, let me go back to you and, and 
obviously this this could take the whole hour yeah, plus say, more really, plus yeah. more but but perhaps if you could uh, just kind of go through some of the policy or the, the most egregious policy mistakes um, and particularly with an eye towards go going forward now um, I mean Lucrezia mentioned that that she thought the budget was balanced um, given the circumstances yeah. so as you say there's an, and I'll focus on the UK um, and, and Lucrezia also know, you know not just a good job of nailing the issues, but explaining the complexity for policy right now. But I, I, I want to pick up on four mistakes. And are we allowed to talk about the B word? Are we, are we with Brexit? I mean, can we sort of can bring that up? Uh, I mean, clearly, the UK is struggling uh, to recover post COVID worse than other countries. Uh, and, you know, as an economist, I wasn't in favour of Brexit. Uh, I think I've learned a lot from Brexit and the economic issues that actually the UK faces. And I think it's perfectly legitimate for a democratic country to consider whether to leave, but it's been unhelpful for growth and actually I would say slightly worse than I thought it would be. Uh, and I don't know how you deliver a good Brexit, but, but there's certainly been a focus on the politics rather than the business realities, which I think has contributed. So I have to put Brexit there. Um, then there was the Truss Quatang uh, interlude, um, uh, which I, 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 I'm going to disagree a little bit. I think there's, there has been more scope for the UK to use fiscal policy, but unfortunately, the way that budget was constructed and presented, it put a target on the UK's back just when global markets were saying, hey, we're worried about financing debt. And so it took away an awful lot of degrees of freedom. It gave more power to the Office of Budget Responsibility. It kind of means with Sunak as Prime Minister, we've got two chancellors running the country. Uh, and so, you know, there's an understandable focus on financial rectitude. But I think there was a bit more wiggle room had we not had that, uh, that budget. Nothing transformative, but a bit more scope. Then I, I'll, I'll build on what Lucretta says about the Bank of England. I'm being very, you know, spreading the blame around here. Um, I think they were late to raise interest rates. I slightly disagree with Lucretta. I think they need to do more. I think there is more signs of inflation in the UK than elsewhere. But there is that uncertainty. And in particular, given how open the UK economy is, the gyrations of sterling are going to have a big impact, and both the fall and the more recent increases as the dollar slips back. I think the biggest challenge we've got with monetary policy, and we've all spent a lot of time focusing on monetary policy in our careers, is I don't think we've got a coherent framework about monetary policy. And part of that is monetary policy always struggles with supply shocks. Uh, it, it's, it's not our natural way of thinking about things. Uh, and we've been saying, it, should we raise interest rates in response to a terms of trade shock? But, you know, the notion of a Phillips curve seemed to disappear quite some time ago. The notion of using short-term interest rates to control the economy disappeared some time ago. And so we've had quite good inflation outcomes until recently, but I'm not sure we can say why. And I think that's a really big problem in how we navigate through a particularly turbulent time. And then I think I'd go back to the fourth and probably the biggest issue. I would say from 2007-8, we thought it was a technical financial crisis and the solutions were liquidity and technical financial measures. I think it was a problem about growth. And so I think around the world, and particularly in the UK, we haven't focused on the long-run growth issues, which of course are all around us. How do we respond to environment, the green economy? How do we respond to AI? I'm particularly interested in aging society and longevity, but we haven't been thinking about long-run growth. And I think we saw the financial crisis as mainly about technical financial issues in the Bank of England, and what we really need is real growth. Um, just to pick up on that, and, and Paolo, perhaps, I, I was just going to turn to you because one of the things I w wanted to ask you about as well is clearly there's a lot of global problems going on. Slow growth is a problem everywhere. But the UK is particularly bad. It's the only one of the G7 countries that has not actually even returned to its pre-pandemic levels. Why is growth so slow and productivity so much worse in the UK than other places? So this is an excellent question. I'll, I'll start with that and then I, want, I would like to add Go the ahead. policy mistake to, to, to the list of, yes, of there's Andrew. Yes, there's a lot of, there's, so that's to, a long list. To be clear, they call it the productivity puzzle. The reason why after the financial crisis we have not seen as much as productivity as uh, uh, we would have hoped. Uh, and I must say that, unfortunately, the UK is uh, in good company here, uh, in the sense that uh, if you uh, talk to Treasury officials, it's been in their mind how to stimulate uh, growth, how, what fiscal policy can do about that. Um, again, at the risk of being uh, 
to, to, to bias by my, my, my own research, the usual recipe for boosting productivity is invest in education, uh, which of course we know works, but it takes generations for this to happen. What I found in my, in my own research is to notice that every time that there is a, a boost in uh, 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 military spending, we also have a boost in productivity. So I started to ask myself what is driven this uh, boom generated by military spending, and what I found is that whenever there is a military spending, a typically military conflict, there is such a boost in public R&D, we generate the seeds for private innovation, which then are followed by a boom in productivity. So we go further and ask ourselves, can public R&D investment be able to generate a boom in productivity even without a war? And luckily enough, we found that it does. So, and I see public R&D as one of those areas that has been cut across the board in many advanced economies. And therefore, based on what we find on 125 years of data, is really where most government could uh, purposely uh, uh, invest, uh, even more than in public investment, surely much more effective than public consumption. Investing in public R&D has the potential of boosting productivity. If I may go back to, to, to a policy mistake, simply because join the dots from uh, Mark Twain of history repeat itself uh, to the fiscal policy coordination. And the policy mistake and success I wanted to add is the Federal Reserve in the US during the great inflation of the 70s. We've had uh, an oil price shock and a commodity shock and the Fed that was reluctant to increase much interest rate in the fear of causing more unemployment. So interest rates were raised, but by much less than inflation. In the end, the inflation squeezed real wage so much that it generated a drop in demand, and in the end, the worst of both worlds. High inflation and high unemployment. In the face of an oil supply shock, a global external supply shock. How that uh, mistake was reversed was in the early 80s when a new Fed chairman tied interest rate and he got credited for the win over inflation. But actually, I don't think this is the full picture because at the same time, the US government engaged into expansionary fiscal policy. So doing at the same time, a, fiscal policy coordination with a tight monetary policy and an expansion in fiscal policy generated growth for the, negative, for the following 20 years and a very stable and low inflation. Mm -hmm. So just to follow up on that point, are you then saying given the comments about fiscal policy before, should actually this government be spending more in terms of investment, whether it's in infrastructure or education in order to see those productivity gains down the line? This could bring higher productivity, but investment in education and investment in infrastructure historically have not brought the productivity gain that investing in public R&D, mm -hmm. research and development, have brought. Mm -hmm. If you think about the Manhattan Project in the US, DARPA, which has been linked to the creation of the internet, they've all been triggered a wave of innovation in the 15 years after, which has brought a massive improve in productivity. Mm -hmm. We have had an example with COVID. Public R&D devoted to developing a new vaccine. Well, the forecast based on my own research is that we are going to see a wave of innovation in the health mm -hmm. system that hopefully will bring up productivity in the next 10, 15 years. But public R&D seems to have much more power in generating productivity gain than education or public infrastructure. Uh, comments. Mm -hmm. okay, we have a war, so we have research and development, uh, and then we have productivity, so that's good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I will turn to questions in a moment to the, to the audience, but Linda, uh, I, I know the focus here is the UK, but given what's going on in China, it is such a powerhouse global player, uh, both economically in terms of supply chains and, and, and so many other ways. And what we're seeing, aside from some of the, the supply chain issues we, you talked about earlier, but also now the political unrest that's going on, maybe you could just vote, tell us a little bit more about what's happening there and how that's going to uh, kind of ripple across and affect economics over here. 
Yeah, um, it's a great, um, I think one of the ways in which countries come out of recession is to export. And so having a sense of the global picture is actually you know, quite critical, especially because China is such an important manufacturing center. So as I said, supply chain disruptions there have um, implications for our terms of trade shock here. Um, so I think the, you know, uh, China is um, a, a dozen contradictions before breakfast. So half the things I say will contradict the other half of the things that I'm going to say. So you have um, Xi Jinping taking on an unprecedented third term. There is a risk of over-centralization of economic policy decisions, which goes against how China has been successfully growing um, over the past 40 years. However, under Xi Jinping since 2012, it's also the case that private companies went from having a very small share of the market to over half of the biggest companies in China are now private companies. And so that is a massive contradiction and one in which um, if the current pattern continues suggests that um, a lot of the uh, the growth that we've seen in China could now shift to domestic companies innovating more selling to the domestic market and a degree of fragmentation so what does this mean for the rest of us China's zero COVID policy is gradually being relaxed but it does um, it still does uh, impact um, its growth and so um, if we're looking to the rest of the world um, to help uh, us uh, come out of the recession and export, I think China is going to be weaker um, than probably the United States um, in the coming uh, couple of years. However, over the kind of longer term, if we have this greater fragmentation because China is more focused on domestic demand, has its own innovation and own standards, I do think overall that could um, itself generate uh, challenges around trade and potentially, um, you know, make it harder for the UK as a trading nation to uh, to maneuver this kind of system. Given that our um, alliance is uh, is with the United States or what's becoming now called the Global West, um, I tell Gideon Rachman that I would use that term more because he, <laughs> he's coined it. So, um, so I think, um, so I think, you know. Having, uh, you know, we follow the United States very closely here, and I think it is worth following um, China as well as the two main engines of growth because it will affect um, what happens here. Um, and then, um, if I can just add to what Andrew said about uh, everybody wants to add to policy mistakes, I'm actually <laughs> going to tell a joke, <laughs> which is um, it was reported, I think, in the uh, in the press, probably in the New York Times as well, that. Um, uh, about quasi Kwatong. So I was, um, I was in uh, Washington for the IMF um, World Bank annual meetings, and uh, he was flying back um, at the end of the week, and, uh, and he had a hard time finding a flight because um, nobody wanted the then Chancellor quasi Kwatong anywhere near business or economy. <laughs> <laughs> Economists are not known for our jokes, just, <laughs> you know. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I'm going to uh, t b both take questions from the audience. I'm also here on our online audience. Is there somebody with a mic, perhaps, that can bring a mic around? Great, thank you. So let's start with this gentleman over here. Yep. And I'm going to please ask people to, to please uh, questions and not statements and, and short, just so we can get as many people uh, sure. participating as possible. Thank I'm you. I'm Simon Hills. I left this the August institution 42 years ago. So I've, I've worked in the city ever since. So I've seen a few crises. Um, I'm just wondering, I'm going to be a bit contrarian here and wonder if we're, uh, we should challenge ourselves to think, this, is this actually a crisis or is it a challenge? I totally agree with Andrew about issues around structural inequality and uh, the poor growth we've experienced in the UK, but we, we're not, not actually seeing um, member banks that I speak to, impairments uh, ticking up substantially, other than in you know, the 25-year-old credit card uh, category, which I think the New York Times picked up in the States as well. So crisis or challenge? Mm -hmm. Lucrezia? Well, I mean, uh, I don't know the difference between uh, a crisis is a challenge, uh, so, you know. Or an opportunity, we are let's a challenge. say. Maybe we have an opportunity, okay, so that uh, the opportunity is what, uh, you know, uh, both Andrew and, uh, and Paolo talked about, the fact that we need uh, public spending uh, for long-term uh, objectives, uh, like productivity, which is number one uh, problem in the UK. The question there that maybe we haven't touched upon yet is, uh, uh, I mean, this requires more public debt. 
And the more public debt, if you think that this is going to buy your future growth, that's good. We have had in you know, the past decades uh, uh, you know, a very favorable situation in which the growth rate of the economy was larger than the real interest rates at which you know, public, uh, the sovereigns financed themselves. So the question is what's going to happen in the next decades. And you know, so to, in order to understand whether we could actually you know, get this opportunity and do all this R&D and all these things that you want to do, is really very much depend on that kind of gap between the real interest rate and, uh, and rate of growth. Now, it turns out that that gap, okay, so when we have that gap, that means that actually the gov government uh, enjoys some synergy, some privilege of running, uh, you know, running debt and, you know, and also running deficit so that, uh, and the question whether the government can actually benefit from that privilege really depends on the credibility of the government. This, there is plenty of historical uh, studies that show that. And uh, one issue in the UK is exactly that credibility. And I think I agree with Andrew that the, the problem in September was not so much the unfunded spending but the fact that it was done in a way that was completely non credible, okay? Discrediting the Bank of England, discrediting the OBR, and so on and so forth. So I think the UK has a problem of governance, and I think this is very challenging. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just want well, to be interested in what the others think. I can't recall a time in my career as an economist where the economic community is so convinced how bad things will be. You know, we've got problems in China, which are different. We've got problems in the US, we've got problems in Europe, problems in the UK. And there is a really widespread consensus of a very nasty thing happening. Normally when economists forecast, a few people are out there early, but we sort of catch up with the data. But I, I, this seems to be really dramatic, the difference. I don't know what others think on that. Gretzi, you, you spent a lot of time forecasting. What's your view? I don't do forecasting. I do only forecast of the present, you know, <laughs> or the past, or the past. The future is too challenging for me. Yeah, okay. So. Uh, uh, very good. No numbers, no dates. But I mean, do, <laughs> scenarios, but, scenarios. Now, actually, you know, all the central banks talks about robust control and scenarios. That means that they have no idea about what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, another question. Uh, that gentleman in the back, on the. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm just trying to understand the sectoral impact, particularly or hospitality and in the tourism sector because of this, because after pandemic or during pandemic, they were the most impacted sectors. Is there anything that you could highlight as a headline message? That will be helpful. I'm sorry, I had trouble hearing yeah. the question. Is uh, it clear? The sectoral impact is what I'm interested in. The sector to know. impact. Yeah, pretty much in hospitality and tourism sector impact. Uh -huh. Any uh, headline messages I want to know? On how, actually, that, uh, about hospitality, which kind of, which uh, actually um, is a little bit similar to a question that came in from Nicholas online, which I was going to ask next, uh, which is also there's this aspect you got in London, and maybe London is a bubble, and there doesn't seem to be any evidence of you know this cost of living crunch in the sense that shops look packed pubs look packed, restaurants. Um, there is some evidence of fallen foot traffic. But, you know, in terms of these industries, are they, are we in a little bubble right now before the holidays and that's gonna dip? Uh, what's your sense of that in terms of the sectors that are gonna be hit hardest? So there is a very strong empirical regularity uh, that we have observed across uh, most of the previous recession. The first thing that households tend to cut are non-essential. If you look at the Bank of England survey, both across households and across firms, cutting spending on non-essential is ranked even higher than anything to do with the food or energy or things that you may think are more associated with the current price spike that we receive, that, that, that we are seeing. Hospitality is one of the sectors uh, that more like cinema, theater, dining out, which are the first thing that we know households tend to cut in terms of their spending. Something that is not appreciated, however, is that non-essential sector 
like hospitality, tend to employ a much larger share of low-income households. Those are the same people that not only are more at risk of losing their job, but also the one who is spending directly depend on how much they earn. And this is, goes back also to your question, when a challenge becomes a crisis. Once you see it, it's probably too late. But if history serves as a guide for looking forward, you can expect, and we are already seeing the first sign of this, that non-essential sector, non-essential spending is dropping. If that one is going to be considerable as a way of people defending their standard of living, so cutting what is not essential, going on lower quality of the same kind of grocery, this is going to be felt more by those low-income households whose consumption is more directly linked to how much they earn, and then you get an amplification that may be really large in quantitative terms for aggregate demand. Mm -hmm. so, so let me ask here to follow up on that. We haven't really talked about the labor situation in the UK, and there has been clearly a labor shortage here, partly due to Brexit, um, and certainly very uh, obvious in the hospitality sector, and there's been lots of reporting how restaurants can't even stay open all the hours. So will that, in a way, serve as perhaps a, a you know, hedge against some of the unemployment or the downside effects of, of the slowdown, particularly in sectors like hospitality? Well, you know, the labor market is difficult to read because uh, it is true that unemployment has been low, but labor force participation has declined. And so the UK is facing a situation which is very similar to the US, in which post-COVID, the people have not gone back to work. There is research by, for example, Jonathan Haskell at, at the Bank of England that says that uh, this trend in the UK is linked to health conditions of uh, a big chunk of the population. So, I mean, this is very troublesome because although the market seems tight, you know, you can argue of really mm -hmm. what those numbers really mean. And I, can I just pick up, because this feeds into my stuff on longevity, because we've got a, a, an older population who have, were accounting for a great deal of employment growth in the 10 years before COVID. You know, people aged over 50 accounted for 80% of employment growth in the UK. Something strange has happened since COVID. They've withdrawn, a lot of them have withdrawn from the labor market. And I'm not sure we fully understand that, but health seems to be a major challenge. And in, you know, we talked about investing in education, we talked about R&D, which I agree with, but we've got a major health challenge here. And you can see that in the regional differences. There are shocking differences in healthy life expectancy and life expectancy, which are really impacting the labor market. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, if I go back to your question about regional issues and, and inequality, you know, we know that in most recessions, the hardest hit are those with the least income, the least resources. Um, and that's going to be a really, really big problem. And yes, London, of course, is very mixed. There's areas in London which are very, very poor. Uh, but the regional impact is going to be really different. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me turn to a cost of living question which came in online, uh, which is, says, as a prospective migrant student from India, should I rethink my choice of the UK <laughs> as the location for education in the face of the cost of living crisis? Well, education is great in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> well, Particularly at the London Business School. I mean, I was going to say this on the, on the hospitality sector too. There's also been a big gain in terms of sterling. So. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in that sense, you know, taking a London Business School degree has never been better value. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly from out of the country. Uh, can I just link that to the previous? Please. Um, so one of the reasons why, and as you say, the UK has actually lagged behind comparable economies in terms of recovering from the pandemic, um, the employment rate is a percentage point lower. And so this picks up about the half a million people who have actually mm -hmm. um, become inactive. And, you know, long COVID, um, is it behavioral? I think those are things which mm -hmm. um, will be a long-term drag because our previous pre-2008 um, growth rate was more like 2.5%, whereas now, and a, mm -hmm. and a chunk of that, about a fifth of that, I think, was around labor supply and, and immigration. So linking to this question, right. <laughs> the UK needs workers. It right. is a tight labor market. And of course, there will be an impact on unemployment as a lagging indicator. It tends to happen after the economy goes into recession, especially in a tight labor market, where I imagine firms want to hang on to workers. Mm -hmm. But unemployment is projected to rise. And so I think it is a complicated picture. But 
Um, I think um, there's, a, there's a UK India free trade agreement being negotiated <laughs> right now. You know, more student migrants, please. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, uh, you know, is it possible, and clearly, although some of it's related to health, some of it is also aging. There, you know, there's a whole portion of the, the workforce that kind of aged out over the years of COVID, that hard times could perhaps push even people who planned on retiring, but perhaps push them back into the workforce because of economic necessities. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I, I say it's a mystery to me why so many people left the labor market. And I think we're still trying to work it out. I think it may be also people realize that it was uh, cheaper not to go to work than they might have thought previously. They might have uh, uh, got a different view, but w w we already knew before COVID that one in five people unretired. Mm -hmm. And I suspect we'll see that as a trend. Because mm -hmm. yeah, if, you know, we're living longer lives. If the income growth is less, you've got to bring more lifetime mm -hmm. income in. It, it has to be working mm -hmm. for longer. Over there, that question, yes. Hi, uh, I'm Rajesh Chandi. I'm one of the academic directors of, uh, of the Wheeler Institute. Thank you, this has been extremely enlightening. Um, a question, so you've given a, a very rightly sobering perspective on the, uh, on the future, or at least uh, the present, uh, and some glimmers of hope in the medium term. Paolo, you mentioned 15 years from now, perhaps we'll <laughs> see the uh, benefits of uh, COVID-related expenditures and so on. If I'm a business person today, especially an SME, say, uh, or a consumer today, what can I do in the short to medium term to make my life a little better, assuming I want to live in this country? It's like you've stumped, <laughs> you've stumped the panel. <laughs> so, so you're asking whether we have a silver bullet. No, no. Uh, I mean, what we have seen uh, uh, is that uh, the, the firm that is innovated most. Uh, so what we typically observe uh, in the cohort of young firm is a very striking regularity. 50% of them do not survive the two, three years. And 50% of them grow into solid business, which doesn't necessarily mean big business. It's a very strong empirical regularity that we have observed. And the difference between the success and the failure, in the end, they boil down to productivity. So I'm not going to lecture on how do you get that productivity from given your personal innovation, but there is a very important point for policy. You need to make sure that uh, the percentage of business that fail are not those that would thrive was not for the fact that they started in a recession. Another very strong empirical regularity that we see, which is true both for households and firms, is that uh, people that go on the labor market during a recession, their lifetime income is lower. Firms which are born during a recession are much more likely to get out of business before than their counterpart born not in a recession. Just to give you a sense, small and medium enterprise account for less than 10% of employment in this country. But when it comes to employment growth, they account for more than 30%. In other words, young SME account from the bulk of job creation and job destruction. Now that they are going to face higher borrowing cost, perhaps is a fiscal policy interest to try to think of an intervention on the mortgage market, not just to help low-income households, but also young SME to navigate this difficult time. Which brings me back to one, I think, of the big issue. In the face of a supply shock, in the face of a shock that brings inflation and unemployment in different direction, you really need monetary and fiscal coordination. If the Bank of England will choose to tighten further, or given already what he has tightened, there are going to be good outcome on inflation and less of a good outcome on employment. But this is fine 
as long as monetary and fiscal policy work together and fiscal policy intervene on the mortgage market to allow those SME to thrive if their underlying productivity is strong. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure it's a direct question on the uh -huh. silver bullet, but I can tell you what perhaps fiscal policy can do to make sure that those champions will grow into champions mm -hmm. and will not be like a, a, a collateral damage of uh, the incoming crisis. Andrew. Yeah, and, and you know, it's a good question. Of course, you don't want to ask a bunch of macroeconomists how to run a company. Uh, and you know, I don't want to be, we said we'd be dismal, and we have been. I don't want to be too dismal. I, I can remember in January 2002 being on a plane taking a group of Sloan students on a global business experience to Argentina. And Argentina in 2001, at the end of the year, had had the most disastrous economic scenario. The currency had plummeted, the banking system had crashed, GDP had fallen by 20%, a generation had lost their wealth. It, it was really sort of macro apocalypse type stuff. And I'm on the plane looking and thinking, this is going to be miserable. And the business people were all remarkably sanguine. They said, this is the time when we make our big moves. This is the time when we determine who's going to win the next 10 years out. So I, I thought that was an interesting difference between a macroeconomist and a business person. Uh, and you know, if you think about GDP, there's a German saying, I'm told, that says everything tastes better with butter. And I think that's you know, a, it's a great thing. Uh, everything tastes better with GDP growth as well. You know, <laughs> business is so much easier when the whole economy is growing. But just because the economy isn't growing much or maybe shrinking, doesn't mean necessarily it's bad for business. So what are the two ways you can do it? Within your sector, you can get more market share. And then also within the economy, some sectors are growing more than others. And that's really the opportunity for business to say, well, within my sector, can I grow my market share? Is my sector one that's growing fast? And how do I come out of this downturn with a higher level of productivity than I went into? Mm -hmm. uh, and and that, that's what businesses have to focus on. Well, one thing that I think is specific of this crisis uh, is energy prices and the uncertainty on the future development of energy prices. So assuming that uh, energy prices, uh, and now they are going down, okay, but it's not obvious uh, that, uh, you know, they will be down in a persistent way. But, uh, I mean, if this is going to persist, the relatively high energy prices, uh, this will imply massive reallocation. And there is a case for government uh, to help the transition to, you know, a higher consumption of renewable. Oh, so I think that that will be the key, actually, so more than mortgage. I mean, if you have, since we don't have infinite money to spend, I mean, I think that that's probably the most useful thing that the government can do. I mean, to, you know, to accompany the economy mm -hmm. to the medium path. But, you know, uh, the energy price uh, question mark uh, is, is very, very material. Especially, well, in continental Europe, uh, Germany, Italy, you know, oh, very intensive uh, consumer of energy. This is uh, massive, and we have seen it, uh, uh, you know, how the business sector has been hit, okay? In the UK, maybe less so, but still, I mean, I think that that's a big concern. I think, can I just add on individuals? Um, so, um, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be tough for a lot of people. So I think probably the same kind of lessons from companies you could apply to your own households, which is watch costs. And we've already heard about, um, the fact that people do cut back. So obviously for the equivalent for companies in a recession is to watch your bottom line. But the, the other side of that is that you invest. So you should invest in yourself. You should invest to become more productive. You should try and enhance your skills because all of those things will help you come out the other side better because where there's a, Bus, there will be again a boom um, and then a practical tip which is um, so in this country at some point uh, it's a scenario it's it's not a according to national grid it's not a high likelihood but there is a likelihood that on a dark Tuesday in February between the hours of four to seven there will be a power cut so just brace yourself charge your devices um, <laughs> before February <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, I, I, we're, we're a couple minutes over one o'clock, so I think we're just going to have time for one more. Yes, the, but the, 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 the timekeeper is telling me. Last question, and, and please, if you could quickly. Sure. It's a really quick one. Um, should banks be better regulated to make sure they're passing through savings rates and capping interest rates on loans and debt for businesses and individuals? Should banks be better regulated to make sure they're passing along savings and such? Well, I mean, one, one question that uh, uh, 
the gentleman there ask, I mean, about banks. Uh, I mean, I think that the fact that banks today are much more capitalized than what they were in 2008 has been very helpful. So I would say in that, in that sense, bank, uh, have, I mean, that piece of regulation has actually helped. There is another question which I don't think is really about uh, passing uh, the interest rate, but more about, uh, you know, mar how market is regulated. And, uh, and you know, we have seen uh, quite a lot of uh, liquidity squeezes. Well, we have seen a massive one in September in, in the UK, but we have seen it in the US as well. And there is a question of whether this liquidity episodes uh, which uh, threaten financial stability even in a world in which there are abundant reserves uh, is actually the, resu the result of uh, bad regulations uh, after 2008. And I think this is an open question which I think the Financial Policy Committee will have to address. But I'm not sure that uh, there is an issue of regulation uh, in terms of pass through from the policy rates to the lending rate. Um, well, I think uh, there's so much more to talk about, but unfortunately we're out of time. Um, I want to thank our panelists and everyone who participated online and here. And if you did find the forecast uh, for the future very depressing, keep in mind that one thing economists, as is everyone else, are really terrible at is forecasting the future. So, <laughs> so perhaps that's the glimmer of hope. Thank you, Patty. Actually, you stole my joke. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Lucre. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Linda. So I just want to, to conclude, uh, uh, actually touching on some issues that uh, all of our panelists uh, discussed. So uh, with Rajesh Chandi, we go every year with an amazing program of the London Business School called Global Business Experience Johannesburg in a, in a township in South Africa. And there we see the ongoing crisis. But at the same time, we see this business dynamism and this optimism, even when situations are very hard. You know, I think Andrew Scott, you established the, the GB program. We go with another colleague in Athens. Even at the peak of the crisis, you could see this dynamism. So, Patty, I think you can have it both ways. You know, it's good to have the macro hat on and see what the conditions are. But, you know, we have this, uh, uh, you know, this mindset of, yes. of doing good. And actually, going to the question, uh, of our friend from India, this is the time to visit LBS uh, in some sense, and you know, building on Linda's point, you know, to learn from this amazing group of colleagues that I have. I just want to flag that the Willard Institute for Business and Development, we will have an event in January uh, where another prominent uh, uh, economist and good friend, Sergey Guriev, uh, who is the leading voice uh, for economic reform in Russia, uh, well before actually. Uh, the crisis, uh, you know, will be joining us and we'll be discussing more about spin dictators uh, based on his recent book, but also about the ongoing crisis uh, fueled by the conflict uh, uh, between Russia uh, and Ukraine. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.